Welcome back to the Art of Climate Modeling. We're continuing our discussion of the atmospheric dynamical core today with an overview of numerical methods available for discretizing the temporal component of the fluid equations. This topic is again broken up into five subtopics, including motivation, an overview of simple explicit and implicit methods, an overview of Runge-Kutta methods, a discussion of Lagrangian and semi-Lagrangian methods, and a brief explanation of numerical stability and how to assess model stability. Today's lecture covers the first two of these topics. Okay, let's get started. Time integration in atmospheric models remains an active area of study, with new methods like exponential integrators and additive Runge-Kutta methods now coming online. In the last two lectures, we discussed spatial discretizations, which was the most relevant for the derivative operators that appear in the fluid equations. Each of the spatial discretizations introduced a new way to represent the continuous data in a discrete way, and introduced a new way to estimate spatial derivatives over the discrete data. In the context of the advection equation, this was the spatial derivative term. However, we didn't talk about how to represent temporal derivatives. Even if we can reduce our partial differential equations to a set of ordinary differential equations, we still need to solve those ordinary differential equations somehow. This motivates the question, how do we best represent the dynamic evolution of the atmosphere? Or, how do we deal with the time dimension? As mentioned earlier, through the process of spatial discretization, we now have a set of coupled ordinary differential equations, one for each degree of freedom in the data. In the most general sense, this means we have a set of differential equations where the left-hand side is the time evolution of q at the point j, and the right-hand side is a function whose argument is the vector of all discrete data values. Note that this doesn't mean that all data values are necessarily involved in the update at a single point. For example, if we were to employ a finite difference method with a central difference operator to the advection equation, for a constant velocity, we would obtain the equation at the bottom. In this case, only two of the q values are involved in the update of qj. Notably, all of the methods we have discussed in lecture 3a and 3b are linear discretizations when applied to a linear differential equation. That means that, if applied to this linear differential equation, such as the advection equation with constant velocity, the function f could be represented as a simple matrix multiplication. That is, the time evolution of a vector of data values would equal a matrix A times a data vector. This matrix is known as the spatial discretization matrix. Consider again our finite difference discretization with central differences operator. If applied over six data points in a periodic domain, the evolution matrix would appear like the array below. The matrix is always square as it denotes the effect of each data point on each of the other data points. There are a few things to note about this system. First, observe that the matrix is mostly zeros. The only non-zero elements appear to the right and left of the diagonal. The exception to this is at the top right and bottom left corner, where the non-zero elements are present because of the periodic boundary condition. Second, notice that every term in the matrix is either equal to positive u over 2 delta x or negative u over 2 delta x. The term u over delta x has units of inverse seconds, that is, it's a frequency, and so sets a time scale associated with the problem. Its inverse, dx over u, is associated with how quickly information propagates across one grid cell, and is closely linked to the time scale of the discrete problem. We'll find later that this ratio actually sets a speed limit on the propagation of discrete information. These matrices that consist mostly of zeros are referred to as sparse matrices. In general, spatial discretizations that use local information, including finite difference, finite volume, and finite element methods, lead to sparse evolution matrices. Of the methods discussed, the only one that leads to a dense matrix is the spectral transform method, which, you might recall, is perfect for any di linear differential equation. Thus, the more local methods can be thought of as sparse approximations to the spectral transform solution. These local methods are nonetheless advantageous because they can substantially reduce the computational cost of calculating the discrete derivative. The more accuracy we demand from our spatial discretization, the more dense this matrix becomes. But a more dense matrix is more computationally expensive, 
So inevitably, there is a trade-off between the accuracy of the numerical method and its efficiency. However, even the most accurate numerical methods can only work with the data that is resolved at the grid scale. No matter how accurate we make our numerical methods, they cannot know about subgrid scale features that were averaged over when we put them on the discrete grid. Thus, it's often better to use a less accurate numerical method if it enables you to increase the number of discrete grid points. With a known spatial discretization matrix, we can actually solve this equation directly. If A were a scalar instead of a matrix, you've likely already been exposed to the general solution of this kind of problem. If you've taken higher level calculus classes, you're probably also aware that there is an analogous solution when A is a matrix using an operator known as the matrix exponential. Exponential integrator methods have been studied in recent years that essentially solve this problem in this manner. However, actually computing the matrix exponential is computationally demanding even for sparse matrices and so operational models rely instead on discrete approximations to the matrix exponential. With that in mind, let's start to look at the simplest of these approximations. The linear discretizations just discussed appear here in the top left box. More generally, for nonlinear differential equations, we might have a discretization like the one in the top right. The quantity f is known as the time tendency of the state q since it encapsulates the rate of change in time of q. Integrating these discretizations with respect to time allows us to convert them from differential form into integral form. By fundamental theorem of calculus, the integrated time derivative simply becomes the difference between the values of q at the end and beginning of the time step. We'll denote the time index of each time step with a superscript index and denote the time period over which we're performing the integration as the interval between tn and tn plus 1. We assume that all information is known at time n. That is, we know the current state of the system and can calculate spatial derivatives over that state using an appropriately chosen discrete derivative. Our goal will then be to obtain the state of the system at time n plus 1, the next time step. To do so, we'll need to estimate this integral using only known information. In order to visualize these solutions, consider a 2D plot with space along the horizontal axis and time along the vertical axis. We are discrete in both space and time, meaning information is known only at select points. We do know the state at the initial time, which we denote with superscript n. The initial time is tn and the final time is tn plus 1. The initial state at point x sub j is denoted qjn, and the final state is denoted qjn plus 1. To update the state, we need to calculate the integral of the right-hand side along the green line shown in this figure. So if data is only known at the initial point, how do we compute that integral? Well, if f were only dependent on the initial state, then the integral would be trivial. Under such an approximation, we can write the integral as delta t times f at the initial time, where delta t is the di difference between tn plus 1 and tn, that is, the duration of the time step. Making that substitution yields a scheme for integrating in time known as the forward Euler method, our first explicit scheme. Observe that with the forward Euler method, we have written the unknown state purely in terms of the known state. This then enables us to update the system in time. At each time step, we simply evaluate the right-hand side with the known state, and then compute the updated state. But what if we use the final state instead of the initial state to approximate the integral term? In that case, the right-hand side then consists of both the known initial state and a term, which is a function of the unknown final state. If we could solve this equation for qn plus 1, then we could also obtain a solution of the problem. The resulting method is known as the backward Euler method, our first implicit scheme. Although more complicated, this is nonetheless a single equation in a single unknown, and so we would expect that it does have a solution. This is, of course, far more involved than the forward Euler method. To understand how we might go about solving this problem, Let's first consider the case of a linear right-hand side. If this function was linear, we'd replace f with a times q, yielding the top left equation shown here. Moving all terms with qn plus 1 to the left-hand side and inverting yields the second equation here, which explicitly isolates the unknowns and the knowns. However, solving this system does require the inversion of a linear system, 
using techniques from linear algebra. Although certainly doable, solving a linear system is potentially expensive and does introduce a need for non-local exchange of data. How about a non-linear discretization? Well, whenever we have a non-linear problem, we can always linearize it using a Taylor series expansion. That is, we can approximate the function evaluated at time n plus 1 as the value of the function evaluated at time n plus a term proportional to dfdq times qn plus 1 minus qn. Here, dfdq is the Jacobian matrix of f, which is the derivative of each component of f with respect to each state variable. Substituting this expression into the backward Euler method and solving for qn plus 1 yields the linear implicit backward Euler method shown below. The resulting expression, again, only relies on the solution of a linear system. Sometimes linear solutions are insufficient, in which case more complicated methods like Newton iteration may be needed. This technique may also be sped up using Jacobian-free Newton-Krylov methods, for instance. We thus have the forward Euler method, which is an example of an explicit scheme, and the backward Euler method, which is an example of an implicit scheme. In general, methods are referred to as explicit methods if the right-hand side is evaluated only using known information. If the right-hand side is evaluated using unknown information, then they are implicit methods, requiring the solution of an implicit equation. Given that implicit methods are clearly substantially more complex than explicit methods, we could ask why we would even consider them. Well, in practice, operational models do almost exclusively use explicit methods. That being said, implicit methods are useful because of their linear stability properties. As we'll see later, implicit methods generally have no limit on the time step size permitted by the model, while explicit methods are constrained in their time step size by a condition known as the CFL condition which requires that the time step be bounded by a small multiple of dx over u, where u is the maximum wave speed from the problem. For the atmospheric fluid equations, that wave speed is the speed of sound. Let's talk about accuracy. Since this is another factor that plays an important role in the choice of temporal discretization, we're going to turn our time axis on its side for a moment and use the vertical axis to denote the value of the nonlinear time tendency. If we were able to integrate exactly under the curve, then we would be able to perfectly advance the state in time. The methods we've discussed so far only allow us to approximate this integral. For both forward Euler and backward Euler methods, the time tendency over the whole time step is approximated as constant. This means that the integral ends up being approximated as a rectangle with one edge having length delta t. In the case of the forward Euler method, the integral is approximated as delta t times f at time n. In the case of the backward Euler method, the integral is approximated as delta t times f at time n plus 1. As is obvious from these plots, both the forward Euler method and the backward Euler method are crude approximations to the actual integral under the curve. In fact, we refer to both forward Euler and backward Euler methods as being only first order accurate. This means that these methods are only exact when the time tendency f is constant. When it comes to atmospheric modeling, first order methods are generally insufficient, and when they are stable, can be shown to produce poor, highly diffusive solutions in the dynamical core. We need to do better. In light of the issues with first-order methods, one of the first explicit second-order methods introduced in atmospheric science, and a method commonly paired with spectral transform methods, is the leapfrog scheme. The idea behind this method being that if we can incorporate additional information from earlier in time, we can build a more accurate solution. Methods of this type, those that rely on information from previous steps, are referred to as multi-step methods. The two-step step discretization then integrates the discretization from time n minus 1 to time n plus 1, yielding the integral on the right. As a second-order method, it can be shown that the leapfrog scheme is exact if the time tendency f is either constant or linear. The leapfrog method attains this second-order accuracy by using the midpoint to estimate the integral. The resulting scheme then looks like the form shown here in the bottom right. Graphically, the method looks like the image on the left. 
The improved accuracy of this estimate to the integral is clear on noting that the overestimate for values of t between tn minus 1 and tn matches well with the underestimate for values of t after tn and before tn plus 1. That is, we can transpose the overestimated triangular region on the left to the right in order to estimate its underestimated value. As mentioned earlier, the leapfrog scheme was used for years in conjunction with the spectral transform method. However, the leapfrog scheme might also have reminded you of the central difference discretization we discussed in the context of spatial discretizations. In fact, much like that scheme produces a computational mode in space, leapfrog produces a computational mode in time, since the odd and even time levels can separate from one another. The result is checkerboarding in time. This is usually fixed using what is known as off-centering, where instead of using the midpoint to evaluate the time tendency, we evaluate it using a point slightly closer to Tn plus 1. The result is a first-order scheme with good accuracy properties where the checkerboarding effect is suppressed. Another commonly employed method for introducing diffusion is via Aslan filtering, leading to the modified leapfrog Aslan scheme. Although the leapfrog scheme does provide second-order accuracy, it is generally no longer employed in modern dynamical cores. Newer methods from the study of numerical methods have superseded this approach, and we'll touch on these next time.